Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I'm Melinda Moulton, your host, and my guest today is Mary Means. Mary, thank you for joining me. It is terrific to see you again. It's been far too long. I know, and it's such a delight because everything that's going on right now has pertained so much to your life's work. So let me share with my viewers a little bit about who you are. Mary Means is the retired owner of Mary Means and Associates, a small but mighty community planning firm that earned a strong reputation for building bridges between plans and people. Mary conceived the Main Street Project, which had the bold mission of demonstrating economic development within the context of historic preservation. This pilot project evolved into Main Street America. In 2021, Mary wrote Main Street's Comeback and How It Can Come Back Again. And the National Trust for Historic Preservation gave Mary the 2020 Louise DuPont Crown and, Ship, Crown and Shield Award. And Mary is presently working on her memoir. Is that about right? That sounds like me. So I also want to talk to you today about your life and working to help save downtowns. But I want my viewers to know that you and I met when we were serving on the Orton Family Foundation together. And we also just had a little bit of time together down in Washington, DC. Um, and so, um, Mary, let's start uh, with talking about uh, you as an award-winning community planner. Oh, let me turn this off. As a, as a as an as an award winning community planner and innovator, oop, oop, there we are. Okay, are we back now? Good. Okay, so I I want to I want to talk to you about you are an award winning community planner and innovator. And you sparked and inspired this movement in Main Street revitalization for nearly four decades. Can you share with my viewers a little bit about your childhood growing up and who inspired you to pursue this work? Wow, that's an interesting one. Uh, we're going to go way back a long ways now, almost to the 19th century. Not quite. I grew up in Atlanta when my father was um, a classical architect meaning that he might as well have been born in the 18th century. He had a very innate sense of classical proportion. And he thought that the last decent design had been done about 1815. It was a pretty rigid opinion. Uh, my mom was a nurse. I grew up a good childhood in, in Georgia. I can remember when he asked me things that might have influenced um, my path. First of all, I think my father did. But, um, I can distinctly remember at about age 11 or so going to Mr. Fisk's toy store. This toys on Peachtree Street at, uh, at 10th Street in Atlanta. And mom would kind of park us there while she went shopping for groceries next door. And Mr. Fisk treated me and my brother and sister, who were all little, like the customers that we were. And he really respected our opinions. He would let us informally had layaway so we couldn't afford the 75 cent toy that we needed with that week's allowance so we could come back a week or two later and get it and i think it was embedded in me is this is this is my image of small businesses and uh, how distinctly different they are from uh, the businesses that are much larger or, or operating as part of remote ownership somewhere. so that was part of what got me into this um, when I was hired by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 1973 to go out and open the first, uh, the second of the National Trust regional offices, this one was to be in Chicago to cover the Midwest, 11 Midwestern states. And I said, what am I supposed to do? That's my job. And they essentially said, um, we're to make historic preservation happen in the Midwest. Great. So I headed out to do this. I had not gone to college in the Midwest, but that's about all I knew of it. And it was a matter of a year or so of driving around the Midwest a lot, speaking, meeting with a very, very fledgling preservation. It wasn't even a movement. There was like small organizations that were done at the last minute to save a courthouse or something distinctive. But one of the things I noticed is two things I noticed. One was 
There wasn't anything historic in the Midwest. That's what Midwesterners thought. When I would try to talk to them about the beautiful historic buildings in their town, most people would say, there's nothing historic here, it's just old. Historic is Boston and Chicago, Boston and Charleston, uh, but it's not here. And yet, we're coming up on the bicentennial of the country. So I knew that we, we were not going to be able to sell preservation as the architecturally defined quality that um, the National Trust and other preservation folks in the 1970s were doing. Because it just wasn't going to fly in the practical Midwest. You can't tell me that's historic. It's just an old building and it's falling down and we need to stop us. That was one strain. Was I was having a hard time convincing people that it was anything historic. And the second big observation I made was, in addition to really landmark buildings like courthouses and city halls and things like that, there was also this undiscovered and unnoticed ensemble of buildings that are kind of ordinary buildings, but together they were something special. And that was the downtown, the main streets of nearly all of these smaller communities. They were being severely impacted by highway construction that little bypasses around them or shopping centers that were coming in nearby. And they were the businesses were trying desperately to keep up. But it was a real struggle and the towns were uh, in danger of kind of losing their form. And it didn't look like anybody was doing anything to reverse this or try to slow it down. So that's what first got me interested in not just preservation, but in uh, doing something that we weren't doing yet, because whatever we were doing wasn't working right now. Fascinating. Um, so would, would you say that that was the time that you realized that you wanted to be a planner and make this your career? No, I think I realized I wanted, it was subconscious. My, my dad, when we went on vacation as kids, we tried to go to some place that had an, um, a historic character, I would call it now, Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans, Annapolis. My mom would make sure there were kid things to do there too. Uh, we certainly found Bourbon Street to be fascinating for kids in a way that I think my mother appreciated. But I think subconsciously, I, I learned that there were places that were not like suburban Atlanta and sprawling places that had a, a tight sense of, of um, proportion and were pleasant places to be. And I did not know what urban design and landscape architecture was at the time. Um, I just knew I was attracted to places like that. When I got out of grad school, I was very fortunate in being hired by the National Register of Historic Places, which was only about three years old at the time, and there was very little on it, but, but people were beginning to nominate uh, historic sites and places all over the country. If something became listed on the National Register as it is today, it was protected a great deal from the federal bulldozer. Anything that was going to use federal money to alter it or demolish it, had to go through a special review process. And that definitely threw a monkey wrench in the treads of the bulldozer. But nearly everything on a large scale at that time had federal funds involved in it to make the other. Um, so I realized that these buildings would fall in right and left, and these places of character that I loved were in danger. I wasn't ready to be an academic historian or to sit at a desk and uh, make decisions about historic building, I really had a more activist sense of agency. And I realized that my interest in heritage places and architecture and my interest in doing something about it and making, making a difference combined in where the historic preservation uh, was at that time. And that's what led me to it. I later uh, realized that a lot of what I had learned in helping communities um, find their common interest in a main street and doing something about it would be applied to larger working with groups over similar kinds of things, like a, a plan for a town or a plan for a downtown. So when I left the preservation field and became a consultant, that's what I worked in, is community planning. 
not just for Main Street. Sometimes it was for a university that was trying to expand its campus and running into problems with uh, the neighbors. And sometimes it was um, whole regions that were trying to remain competitive. But what the, the thing that brought all of it together was they needed to be able to find common ground, craft a uh, common sense of direction, and then be able to work together to implement it. Um, and I was pretty good at that. So that's why we became small but mighty. Let's, uh, let's talk for a second, Mary, about the impact of COVID on downtowns and how so many downtowns are still suffering from that input put and that impact of that pandemic because so many people ended up purchasing stuff online so we got used to doing that and do we really need to drive into downtown to go shopping and also a lot of people began working from home and doing what you and I are doing right now zoom so the office spaces uh, we're empty and now a lot of businesses are allowing people to work remotely. So talk to me about the effect of COVID on the strength and endurance of our downtowns. Well, I, the immediate effect of it, I was just in the final stages of writing my book, Main Street's Comeback. When the pandemic closed everything in the world, certainly everything in the United States, every business closed down, we all went indoors. We had no idea how long it was going to last or what it was. And my heart just turned over. It's like, I've run a small business. I know about cash flow. They're not going to survive this. What is going to happen? But within a few weeks, the places, particularly the places that had Main Street organizations and have been working on keeping their downtowns lively for years, were able to help their merchants get online or to find ways of dealing with this, to advocate on their behalf with the town governments about allowing alcohol to be sold and delivered at home and things like that for restaurants. Um, so the immediate thing was surprised that we survived even the first few weeks of the pandemic and delighted to see how well adapted the Main Street communities were in terms of being able to help their local, uh, their local businesses. Let's fast forward as we all became much more adept at what we're doing now, uh, having meaningful conversations and making decisions and things like that remotely. Uh, overnight, we were sort of advanced 10 years probably technologically. And grandparents who've never known how to find anything, all of a sudden were living on Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams. And that just changed everything. It allowed people to work from home where there was broadband internet access, I have to say, because there were lots of folks who could say, let me continue this way. No, the whole country doesn't have broadband. It might soon, there's been a significant investment in it recently, I think also spawned by the, by the pandemic. But once we learned to, that we could work from home, a couple of things happened. I would speak of one that's positive, because uh, yes, you're right. A lot of central business districts, particularly in larger cities, have been hollowed out because so many of the office buildings now have far fewer workers and they're on irregular schedules. And they have been the traffic that supported businesses and particularly restaurants and coffee shops and things. So there's been a real domino effect of its impact on, on downtowns in larger cities. Um, but I think the other part of that is what we were seeing within 20, 2020 and 2021 was people in larger cities saying, you know, if I can work remotely, I can work remotely from a small town in Iowa that has really good schools, a decent cultural life, and it's the, and the housing is, you know, 30% of what we're paying here in Chicago or someplace else. So we saw a number of remote workers who could relocate their families to some of the smaller communities. And that really ultimately helped the small communities uh, you know, return to health. Now in the larger cities, we almost developed a downtown that was, um, we didn't realize I think at the time, we put all the chips in one spot. We put all of the major um, office buildings and things in larger cities in the central business district. And there wasn't the kind of 
diverse uses and diverse times of day that there might be other parts of town. So all of a sudden, that's just the move. It's coming back. I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and it's getting better. But one of the reasons it's getting better is the federal government is working with the District of Columbia government about what they're going to do with getting workers back or freeing up some of the space to be leased out to others and for other uses when it really works hard. Not everyone, by the way, I'm going to be Jack on forever. Uh, not everyone is shopping online. I have to confess, I shop online too. But I also, and many people do this, really want to feel the fabric, see the sofa, whatever. So we go into, we, we tend to also go in. And there are a number of places, you know, even Amazon has been opening brick and mortar stores around the country. Um, and we're seeing a, a shift in how retailing is done. That's inevitable, it's a market. But it isn't all necessarily heading to uh, remote shopping completely. No, that, that's that, that's very true. Well, since our audience is Vermont centric, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what you see as the answer to the amount of homelessness and drug use plaguing our downtowns. Just last week, seven days, uh, did a story uh, highlighting the blighted sites in the city uh, where graffiti is rampant and the effects of social systems breaking down where drug use and homelessness has taken over really many of our downtowns. But in Burlington, we are really struggling with this um, as we speak right now. And there are people, when you talk about going downtown, who say, no, I, I, I don't want to go back to Burlington because I don't feel it's safe. Now, I'm not saying that that's the case for me. Um, and I'm actually going to be working on a commentary, which is why I'm so excited to be talking to you, Mary. But these small downtowns are feeling the effects of the social fabric in our country that's really being torn apart. Well, it's really true that that it would seem when you go into many older cities that this is the case, that there's far more visible homelessness for un, unhoused people. Uh, many of them have pretty obvious mental issues that are not being treated. Um, and they look dangerous, they can look dangerous. Um, sometimes the drug problem is a real one there. Sometimes it's a perception of that. But the perception, as Adonis Trump pointed out, perception often is more important than the truth or the reality. But I'm going to go back for a moment. The Main Street movement can help a bit with this, but it can't solve the issue of we have not been building housing that has been able to be afforded by people who are making a very high income in many, many years. And this is not just a New York City metropolitan problem, it's a problem across the country. And the second part of that is, of course, is it's only recently that mental health was even considered a health issue that's made eligible in some insurance programs. So we've neglected areas of housing, and areas of, um, of health, of mental health, for such a long time that there's a lot of catching up to do. And I'm just pleased to see the current administration making bold investments across the board in some of these issues, including investment in broadband, which is going to open up a great deal more potential, uh, and investment in mental health care um, and in housing particularly investment in, in, in housing, to create housing that isn't just a single, single family model, it's market right. Um, and oftentimes a lot of our historic buildings are are, turn, are torn down for for housing, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, you- jump into that a moment. Yesterday, I went to the National Trust for Historic Preservation National Conference at the awards presentation. And I was stunned to see the number of awards that are being given and recognized for converting an old mill building into housing, for converting a, this, that, and the other into housing, how many of them are being uh, done as a combination of mixed income or low income housing. You, you look at them and they're the historic buildings they've always been, but they're housing dozens and dozens and hundreds of families. 
That's outstanding. I know they did that in my hometown of Allentown, which is the whole Bethlehem Steel complex. Yeah been turned into housing and mixed use. And there's still so much more of that facility, um, you know, miles of that facility that are being worked on. So now let's talk a little bit about your incredible book, which Mary, congratulations on your book. Um, it's Main Street's Comeback and how it can come back again. And I encourage my Vermont viewers, especially with community leaders and people involved in some of these organizations that can help our beautiful Queen City, um, to get a copy, and I'm assuming I, it, it's it's available in local bookstores, I'm sure, and you can probably get it online, but always check with your local bookstore and order it there first. So, right. so as, I said, as I said in the book, of course you can order it from the obvious sources, but one of them is your local independent bookseller who can get it easily for you. That's right. So I'm going to give a big push for Phoenix Books. I'll bet they get this book for you folks. Yes. So you do mention Vermont a few times in your book. Um, and you talk about the demolition of the downtown in Winooski, which um, every time I walk, I drive into that city, it, you know, you can't help but, but wonder, you know, what happened to that city. And I, I really agree with you. But I want you to talk about the resilience of downtowns to rebound. And I don't believe many in this country feel that this is going to happen. I think there's a lot of a malaise and a pall around this. And there is a feeling of desperation as we are seeing more and more businesses move from downtowns out to the suburbs. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, Mary? Well, many things are different in Vermont. Um, I haven't really noticed a, a movement of things moving out to the suburbs quite as, as strong as uh, it was in, in the 70s and 80s. But let me go back to um, we were talking about Vermont and, and smaller communities there and resilience. One of the things that came out of not much that was greatly positive came out of the pandemic. But one thing that did was we had a, an amazing test inadvertently of the ability of communities to recover from a disaster. Um, they were able, the, the communities that had very active Main Street organizations or downtown improvement districts and staff and boards and volunteers and all were able to pivot a lot more quickly and help their people adapt and recover and help the community uh, begin, the community to actively support the businesses and the, uh, the residents of all downtowns. So the fact is that the the pandemic kind of identified for us this invaluable uh, use of these organizations in downtowns as what uh, the urbanist Bruce Katz calls regenerators. A regenerate, somebody's gonna have to rebuild after whatever disaster strikes. And there's been established a level of trust, a level of experience uh, working with each other in some of these organizations that can be tapped for wider use when ine the inevitable crises will arise, um, having to do with climate or another pandemic or whatever. Uh, and Vermont um, is, a, is a wonderful, a law for profession, it's a wonder, wonderful woman named uh, Mindy Fullalove, who is a social psychiatrist. I've been called a civic shrink, but Mindy Fullalove is actually a civic shrink. She has studied the way communities and, and, and sort of the organizing of, of community and people are able to work together or not work together all over the place. And she does a wonderful contrast between Vermont's quick recovery from flooding a number of years back and the struggle post -Sand Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey and New York in the absence of the kind of community cohesion that Vermonters seem to have. We're not waiting for the rescue three. We figured a way to hack our way across that flooded stream and get to the other side. That didn't happen in other parts of the country. Yeah, Vermont Vermont does have these incredible organizations and community spirit and soul. Um, but we are struggling, and certainly Montpelier was devastated by the most recent flood, and they're going to have to figure out how to rebuild. But businesses have moved out of Burlington, and they're moving into Essex Junction. They're moving out to Williston. And so... Um, but I, I want to let you know that I and a whole bunch of other people work very hard to save our Memorial Auditorium, which is the gateway to Burlington. And it was being considered for demolition by the existing administration. 
Uh, now there's a housing project that's being proposed uh, in that area and with that building. And I, and I very much believe they will protect that building. Um, our mall was shut down and the big pit, it was literally shut down and there was a big hole. The buildings were all taken down, the big hole that covered you know, two and a half blocks sat vacant, unbuilt for seven years. Macy's, Macy's, which we fought the Burlington Business Association when I was chair, we had a great, great board and we fought to get a downtown department store and we got Macy's. Well, Macy's left downtown when the mall was shut down and that building was vacant until the high school moved in because of toxins at the high school, which the high school needed to be torn down. So now the high school moved into Macy's, but we lost our major department store. So millions were also invested in the renovation of City Hall Park, but folks are avoiding the park because of what's going on in the park with a lot of um, drug use and things like that. So there, the, and the whole thing about the defund the police, which I'm, which I know a lot of people are, um, you know, on both sides of that that discussion. But there's been a lot, you know, sort of an uptick in crime. Um, so there's a lot of social issues that are that are pushing this forward, but. Mary, do you believe that we can protect and save our downtowns if we do not first deal with mental illness, drug addiction, poverty, and homelessness? Well, I think we have to do all of it at once. Uh, a little bit of, of motion on all of it. You can't ignore it because the, the, you mentioned these are huge factors, and they're huge factors in people's trust that downtowns are uh, safe places to be, desirable places to be. I'm wondering with things like your park, when people are saying it's not safe to go there. To me, parks and big public open spaces need constant programming, organized activities and things, stuff that draws people to them. And by the presence of a number of people make it safer by there being more, more I mean, it's only neglected places where bad things happen. For the most part, because there aren't enough eyes on the street, as Jim Jacobs would say. Um, so I think there's going to there's a call on communities to do more to make there a reason, a new reason to be downtown and to be together. I want to return to the Macy's for a moment. There's been really a great deal of restructuring in the entire way we buy things, and department stores used to be the anchors for traditional downtowns. There are no more department stores for all intents and purposes these days. Who would ever have thought that Main Street would survive when shopping centers are being closed? My favorite is one in Shreveport, Louisiana, that's been turned into a mega church. The entire, it's the only church I know with no parking problem. They, they got the whole thing uh, as their parking lot. Um, but I digress. So it isn't a matter of just lamenting that Macy's closed. Macy's is closed just about everywhere. Um, and the next question is, what kind of active uses can be brought in that can work off of each other and be there? And downtown housing is very definitely one of those. There are a number of department stores that have been converted into housing. I saw an example of it given an award by the National Trust yesterday. It actually was um, reused as the offices of a regional health organization that brought 700 jobs right into the downtown, all working locally. So the, the, the customers there for all the businesses. I don't, I can't give you um, a four point solution for right. dealing with the issues that, that towns and cities are, are coping with right now, other than to say, the first thing that needs to happen is we've got to stop avoiding dealing with issues of housing and issues of mental health and start treating those. I think it's unfortunate the term defund the police, but I very much believe in the idea of investing, investing in the prevention of a lot of this by getting at the root issues of mental health. And investing in smart justice. I mean, the pro yes. the project is really smart justice. And how do we re re um, allocate our funding to support mental health in our policing? And I and I and I and I honor you know our our police and our and our justice folks and. Um, and, and, you know, all in all, I mean, Burlington is still winning tr all these awards, you know, the best place to raise a kid, the best place to go to school. I mean, it's still getting all these awards and a lot of this is perception, but perception can really kill a downtown. And I'm, 
And um, so that's what a bunch of us are working on. I just want to let you know that a couple, myself and a couple of historians are working on a Burlington History and Cultural Center. And so much of your work is about people learning and understanding culture. So I wanted to let you know that that's happening. And I know that my team would love to talk to you. And then I wanted to ask you, Mary, um, as we're kind of coming to the end of our interview, do you believe that schools are doing enough to educate our young about the importance of place, our humanities, community, and human experience during a time when hate groups are rising and the rule of law in our own democracy is being challenged? Um, talk to us about your vision of the future of this country, Mary, and how you see us moving through these deeply difficult and challenging times for the last few minutes. If you're running out of time, that's a pretty big one. <laughs> it is a big one, but 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 do you feel like there should be more more education of our youth about the importance of culture in our communities? It's interesting. It was really enlightening going to the National Trust Conference yesterday. It's one of the winners of award is the school in New Orleans. Remember 1960, the first desegregation? There were three very brave first graders who endured a gauntlet of angry, vicious, white feet as they daily went to school, where everyone else was boycotting the school. These three little girls were there. Well, those three little girls are grown women now. That school building had been boarded up for a long time and was facing demolition. They organized and it brought it back as a history and cultural center. And they were there yesterday to receive the award for doing this. And one of them said, our people, everyone needs to know the story of America. And, and America isn't all the Pollyanna Fourth of July stuff. It's, it's got a very troubled history. But until we acknowledge that troubled history, it's going to be pretty hard to, to live through it. And as a person who's trained in history and has been, I've been an advocational historian, I guess, all my life, I couldn't agree more. It's, um, there's such a need for knowing, knowing who we are, all of us, and knowing the good and the bad of all of us, and coming out of it so that we can work together. So I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic. Um, and I think one has to be because hope is the last thing that should leave you. Because if you don't have hope, you might as well just not exist. So I'm hopeful that we're going to see some progress. I've certainly seen a lot of it in the years uh, since the pandemic uh, has passed through. Um, and I have great, I have great hope in our youth too. And um, so I just want to let you know that we did get Amtrak to Burlington. So now we have I the time. That. Right. Um, certainly Biden's infrastructure um, bill is bringing a lot of money into the state as you drive down the roads are closed and getting it's fabulous. And um, again, I am so excited about your book, Mary. And um, to my viewers, it's Main Street's Comeback and How It Can Come Back Again by Mary Means. I suggest you get it and read it. It's easy to read with great photographs. And um, if, if you're curious about how we can help our downtowns in Vermont, Mary's got a lot of great ideas and thoughts. And I'm going to definitely be bringing this to my board for our Burlington History and Cultural Museum. Um, Thank you. You're a great publicist, I mean, we really appreciate that. Oh, I love, Mary, I've loved your work since I first met you back at the Orton Family Foundation. And, and, the, and the Main Street Award, the Main Street Project, was your vision. You were the one who, who really spearheaded going into these, these towns and helping them to understand that, that, that they were great and we needed to protect them. And you were a leader in that. And um, well, I, I will have to say, um, I didn't know it at the time. Um, and I think had I understood how crazy it was to say, this little pre historic preservation organization can tackle the revitalization of town centers. If I'd known how hard that was, oh. I probably wouldn't have started it. But there's nothing like the naivete of you to say, let's try something and we'll see if it works. And if it doesn't work, they've been telling us it wouldn't all along. So no no fault, no, no loss. But it did work. And I had no idea that it would survive and thrive the way it has over the last 45 years. And you and you have helped transform our country in such a such an incredible way, Mary. And you've and you've been recognized um, for that. Uh, I, I always believe in the power of naivete. I say, if you don't know it, then you will create it. And so sometimes the less you know, the better things turn out. 
So Mary, I want you to come back to Vermont and to meet my group, Elise well, and Gail, who are working on our History and Culture Museum. And I want to thank you for all that you have done for our country to help bring back our small downtowns and the work that you're going to continue to do probably through the rest of your life to ensure that that your work continues. I want to thank you for that and thank you for being my friend. Well, it's a joy to be your friend. And um, I, I love Vermont and I would love to come and see what you're doing, do anything I can to help, it, help against it. Thank you so much for today. Thank you, my dear. And we will be in touch soon. Have a good Thanks. day to my viewers and I will see you shortly. Bye-bye.